It's my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Steve Gaines. Dr. Gaines is the Dean of the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. He earned his PhD from Oregon State University and then pursued a postdoctoral research position at Stanford. He was an associate professor at Brown University before he joined the faculty at UC Santa Barbara. His research focuses on marine ecology and conservation, sustainable fisheries, the design of marine reserves, and the impact of climate change on ocean ecosystems. He has served as the director of the UC Santa Barbara Marine Science Institute and currently serves as a science advisor for the Joint Ocean Commission. He has over 150 scientific publications and has mentored over 60 graduate students. That's including our last speaker, Dr. Daniel Zacherl. The title of tonight's talk is The Future of Food from the Sea. Please help me welcome Dr. Steve Gaines. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm honored by the invitation by the Carrillo uh, Marine Aquarium and Alta Sea to be able to come and have a conversation with you tonight. And let's see if we can get up the slide. I threw in a couple 3D slides, too, in case you want to use your glasses tonight. There you go. Okay. That'll do it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, I looked over some of the conversations you've had recently with speakers and some of the other events this year. And there have been a lot of focus on really interesting problems affecting California. Um, what I want to do is take us global and talk about uh, issues that are relevant around the world and in California and really focus on uh, some work that has come out of a lot of the ecological work that we've done over the years that has culminated in terms of looking at how people interact with the sea in interesting ways. And what I want to talk about is food. Um, food is something that, of course, all of us uh, relate to in all kinds of positive ways. Um, it keeps us alive. It's something that uh, uh, we celebrate holidays with special uh, types of foods. I mean, there's just all kinds of really important connections to food in our uh, everyday lives. But food also connects us to the environment, and it connects us that way by some of the impacts that it takes to produce food. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And the motivation for this is looking at how much food we consume. And I, I just want to start off by showing you some information about how the total amount of consumption of animal protein on the planet has been changing. Now, this is looking at a 30-year period, and you can see that roughly the amount of animal protein consumed by people on the planet doubled during that 30-year period. Okay? And the amount that comes from the sea is really these top light blue and the orange, which is from wild-caught fish and farm-raised aquaculture, which has gone up from about 28% uh, of the total amount of protein we eat to about 31%. So it's increasing a little bit as a fraction as the total amount of consumption is going up. Um, this, so this is the past. What I really want to focus on is what's coming. And there are two things that are coming in terms of why this value is going to go up a lot. One of them has to do with the fact that there's going to be more people. And that's obvious um, to some extent. And so I want to uh, kind of to illustrate these, show you a few of these kinds of interesting maps. So this is the way you're used to looking at a map of the world where the size of every country is actually related to its size. So it looks like a map you're used to. But of course, we can make the size related to anything we want. And so, for example, here's what the map would look like if the size was proportional to the population size. So this is population size today. This is what we project by 2050. OK, now I'm going to go back and forth a couple times. And where's the big growth in people? It's Africa, OK? So one of the big issues that's going to be happening in just the next 35 years is a substantial increase in population size that is primarily in Africa and a couple of billion people in addition to what we have today. So that's one factor that obviously leads to more food consumption. 
The other, which turns out to actually be a bigger effect, is this, is that as people become wealthier, they eat more animal protein as a fraction of their diet. And the effect is dramatic. Um, you don't have to worry about the individual countries here, but basically if we look at the average income as a function of the fraction of the diet that comes from animal protein versus plant protein, you see that you go from very poor countries where the fraction is quite small, and with even a relatively modest increase in wealth, you start approaching the levels of animal protein in the diet that we see in the US and other developed countries, about 60 to 70 percent. Okay? So the growth in wealth of, in the developing world is, is going to be a major driver of increased consumption of animal protein. And that's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing in the sense of growth in wealth. The consequences in terms of increase in animal protein, we'll talk about in a second what that means. But here's the same map in terms of what we project as the growth in wealth between today and 2050. And what you can see is that, of course, there's growth in wealth in the developed world. Um, but the big area that is relevant to this question is in Asia, particularly China and India. Substantial growth of people getting out of the lowest levels of poverty and moving into more middle class incomes associated with dramatic increases in the amount of animal protein they're going to consume. These are also both countries that have a lot of people. So let's come back to this. This is today. What do we project by 2050? Well, on the basis of these two things, if in fact nothing changes in terms of people's preferences, this is how much additional animal protein consumption we expect in the next 35 years. It's almost doubling the consumption on the planet once again. So here's the question for my talk. How are we going to produce that? Where's that food going to come from? And what does that mean to the planet? Now, there's been an analysis of this um, that was done by one of my colleagues, Dave Tillman, that looked at it from the perspective of producing food on land. And the conclusion that they came to was that all options for producing that much food are pretty disastrous. And the reason is you can see pretty simply from this figure where the color is areas that are red are where a very large fraction, 80 to close to 100 percent, of the arable land that is appropriate for agriculture are already in agricultural production. So you can see that with the exception of some parts of the US and a little bit of South America and a little bit in Europe, most of the areas on land in terms of agricultural production arable lands are already in agriculture. So the scope for potential production of additional food is limited without big increases in production. And there are a whole bunch of other consequences in terms of greenhouse gases. We're going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, how much area of forest, because the only other way you can do this is do things like take more of the Amazon and convert it from forest into agricultural lands. So the analysis from the, the conclusions from land were very depressing in terms of thinking about where you can actually produce this much additional food without having enormous environmental costs. So when I first heard this topic, uh, and Dave, my immediate reaction was, you're ignoring the ocean in terms of thinking about this problem. And the reason, as you'll see, um, that I um, am interested in this kind of a question is the, um, the fact that it's there we get, as at the moment, 20% of food. But a lot of the things that I work on are things about how we actually potentially could get more food in a sustainable way from the sea by doing things in different ways. So that's what we're going to talk about here and ask this question of, if we put the ocean into the picture, how does this story change? And what does this mean about the next 20 to 30 years? So let's set the stage a little bit. And I want to I wanna come and talk about this question of climate change and food production. You, uh, everybody's aware that right now there's a big international discussion going on in Paris about how nations are going to deal with issues related to carbon emissions that are affecting climate change. Um, and in the vast majority of discussion that you probably have all heard, 
when we talk about climate change issues, you think about things like cars and uh, heating your building and things along these lines that are the major ways that we think about the energy production. But if we actually look at what the various components are of contributions of various kinds of human activities to greenhouse gases, you get a little bit different picture. And the, one of the key things that stand out is the th something that gets very little attention is how big of a role food plays in this issue. So 18% of the current production of greenhouse gases comes from livestock production. And another 12% from agriculture. And if you add in the fact that each of these are associated with some of the land use and some of the other transportation things, it's about a third of the total production of greenhouse gases comes from food. So let's look at how different sources of food influence that. So when we think about land, uh, there aren't that many things that we eat from the standpoint of animal protein. And if you look at the amount of greenhouse gases you get per protein, what this figure kind of shows you is just two things. One is the height of the bar is the average level. You don't need to care about the numbers. I'm going to come back and give you examples of what this means in a real way in a little bit. The height of the bar is the average across all of the different forms of production of these different forms of animal protein. The, the different color down here is the lowest level. So you can think of this as kind of the best practices, the best we can do in terms of minimum amount of greenhouse gas production for a given amount of protein of muttons and goats, for example. Okay? And so you can see that beef and muttons and goats are substantially higher than chicken and pigs. And um, if, there, the, if you look at where this comes from, you know, it's a bunch of interesting body functions. You know, there's basically, when you think about cows, there's about 40% of it has to do with burping out gases that are major green, greenhouse gas production. 26% uh, comes from breakdown of the feces that come from this. Um, and another 30% is the feed. And the part that we think about most in terms of greenhouse gases with food, which is the energy that it takes to produce it, um, is this category up here is only 5%. So issues of how far it gets transported, um, and all these other kinds of things which we, we have lots of discussion about, and it influences a lot of people's behavior, is actually a very small component of the actual contribution of food production to greenhouse gases. Most of it comes from biological characteristics of what you are producing. Okay? So that's on land, those, those values I showed you. What I want to do now is let's look at the ocean. And this is the first time that anybody's really done this kind of a comparison across essentially all forms of food production uh, for animal protein. And I'm, I'm talking about greenhouse gases. I'm going to show you some other uh, characteristics of other kinds of environmental impacts in a minute. But let's talk about fisheries. So this is wild fisheries. In the case of production on land, everything has to do with the species you're growing. That's what determines big differences. And it has to do with the biology. It's whether they break down food by bacteria in their gut, which basically produces methane as a byproduct so that they burp up a, a greenhouse gas that's extremely potent. Um, in fisheries, the differences between species that we eat doesn't really matter. It's how you catch them. That's the really biggest effect on variability in the greenhouse gases that are produced by um, various forms of fisheries. So if we look at this compared to the land, one of the things you can see right off is that there are ways of catching fish that produce, even at the average level, greenhouse gas productions that are better than any possibility on land. And if we look at best practices, which, you can, which are actually really hard to see probably for you, and a couple of these, you can't even tell there's a blue area down there, it's often 10 to 100 times less than the best form of meat production on land. Okay. So that's a good thing. So this is why I was actually pushing this thing is because if we can get more production out of wild fisheries, then we can actually meet a greater fraction of that growth in demand with food that is not going to have anywhere near as big 
of an environmental impact. So how do we do that? Well, there are a couple ways you could get more uh, food from fish. One is you could uh, fish a broader variety of things. And I'll, I can give you two pictures to show you that that really is off the table. And here's why. If we look at the oceans in 1965, so this is when I was 10 years old. Um, this is all of the areas of the ocean where we were catching fish at, the, at, or, at or above the maximum level of productivity of that part of the ocean. Okay, so these are the places where we were catching as much or more than we should have been for maximum production for those places. That's 1965. Here's what that picture looks like when my daughter was 10 years old, 30 years later. There's essentially no part of the ocean for us to move to, with one exception, real deep sea, which is still too expensive to really catch things in most places, to catch more fish. So this is not the option. The option here is not to go to some new places in the ocean to catch fish, to s produce more food. We don't really have that option. We're already fishing the sea spatially virtually everywhere at or above maximum level of production. Well, there's another way. And this is associated with the fact I'm sure many of you have heard that there are lots of problems with fisheries, that we have had some disastrous consequences. I'm not going to go through all these papers. There's a whole bunch of uh, very high profile studies that got a lot of press about the demise of the ocean, collapse of world fisheries, a whole variety of things along these lines. And so this sets the stage, though, for saying there's another way we can catch more, make more food, which is get our act together in the way we manage fisheries. And as a result, there's the potential that we can actually catch more fish at a sustainable level in the future if we actually do this well. Now, um, so to estimate how much fish, more fish we could catch, first thing we have to know is where we are now. What is kind of the average level of over-exploitation of fish? And then as a result, if we let things recover, how much more fish could we catch? So we took about a two-year period to come up with an estimate of this, and it's a really complicated thing to do. And it basically comes down to the fact that it's hard to count fish. So that if you're going to try to estimate how many you should catch, how many fish are out in the ocean, uh, whether we're catching too many, whether we're at about a sustainable level, you've got to have some sense of how many fish are in the sea. Uh, but I love this, this quote that basically says, you know, the same problem is true for managing any kind of natural resource on land. But on land, we can see them, and they don't move, typically, in terms of the kinds of things we normally manage in terms of wild harvest trees. That's not true for fish. So here's the problem. This is basically what we see. We get a lot of information on fisheries, but it's this. It's what we take out. And to really estimate how much better we could be doing, we have to know this. How many are in the water? And that's a hard thing to get at. You can hire a bunch of expensive scientists to go out and do elaborate counts and very complicated models. And that's exactly what um, some of the really well-developed uh, fisheries management agencies, such as NOAA in the US, do to estimate how many fish are out there. Uh, but that's a, a very expensive thing. It costs between half a million and a million dollars to estimate the number of fish for one species one time. So you can imagine for most fisheries, that's an impossible cost to bear because the fishery itself is not worth that much money. So what do we do? So we had to come up with a whole variety of ways of essentially estimating the number of fish with far less information. And I could give you a whole talk on how we did that. There are lots of interesting things which I think are pretty clever about how you can estimate the number of fish mainly by looking at how many you take out. Um, but for reasons you'll see in a couple minutes, I'm not going to show you all the details. I'm just going to show you the result. That if we look at this where we've now expanded the number of species of fisheries on the planet where we have good estimates of how many fish there are from 300 a few years ago to over 5,000. So this is a, um, a really big change in our view, a uh, quantitative view of how, uh, what's the status of uh, current fish stocks around the world. 
And so I've just put this in a simple metric, which is we, if, if, you ha if the fishery is at a place where it's right about where you want to be for catching maximum production, and this is a complicated thing because it, you know, in, a, in a simple way, fish are like a bank account. Um, and, and you're used to a bank account where if you put in a little bit of money, the bank gives you very little interest. And if you put in a lot of money, they give you more interest. And you put in a really lot of money, they probably give you even more interest, right? That's not how fish banks work. In a fish bank, if you put in a little, if you have a few fish, the interest that you get in terms of growth of new fish is small because there aren't very many fish to produce fish. But if you have a lot of fish in a case where they haven't been fished by people, they're all competing with food and they actually don't produce that much. And so you can't harvest very many and have that population stay about at that level. So fisheries management is all really about getting fish stocks to be at a roughly half, 40 to 50% of where those stocks would have been if we weren't fishing them at all. And if you do that, you get the maximum interest rate. You get the maximum return. So that's what this is. We're asking what fraction of the fish stocks are close to this value that gives us a maximum productivity. And what, what, so each of these is then the annual value that's going down. And you can see that uh, 40, uh, 35 years ago, we were at about 80% of fish stocks were actually pretty close to where you'd want them to be for maximum production. By uh, just a couple of years ago, we're down to about half. Okay. So this, though, um, raises a question of why, why are we, why is this problem happening? You know, why are we overfishing this when we know that we could actually catch more fish if we let those stocks stay at a higher value? Um, well, a big part of the problem is related to this guy. I don't know, anybody know who this guy is? His name is Garrett Hardin, and he came up with the idea of the tragedy of the commons. And his illustration was all about fisheries. How many of you have heard of the tragedy of commons? Okay, and if with your other hand, how many of you know what it, how it works? That's what I thought. Most people don't put up both hands. So I'm going to show you how it works. And the cool thing about this is, this is a simple experiment that you can do on your own kids. So here it is. This is an experiment I did with my daughters. You take a really cold smoothie in a single glass. You put two straws in it, and you sit it down in between them. And what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to suck the, through the straw as fast as they can because neither one of them trusts the other one to only drink half. <laughs> okay? And so what happens is they get a brain freeze. <laughs> so if you substitute the um, smoothie for the fish and the, my daughters for the fishermen and the brain freeze for a collapsed fishery, this is basically the problem, that if you've got a resource out there that everybody's kind of competing and racing against each other, your tendency is to take too much because you never, even if you think you're over harvesting, you don't uh, think that the, if you were to cut back on how much you catch, that everybody else would just s fill in the slack and take it up. And so everybody tends to over harvest. And so there are a variety of ways that we can solve this problem. But one of them is a very simple one, which is basically if I give that same if I divide that cup into two cups and give it to my daughters, they drink that drink in a different way. So basically, if they have security of rights to their half, they don't drink it as fast. They kind of steward their smoothie, and it's a much more enjoyable experience to, you know, consuming the exact same thing. So this is, this is the basis of a whole variety of different kinds of approaches in terms of solving fisheries, which is effectively to give some ownership to fishermen in a way that solves this tragedy of the commons problem. And just as an evidence to show you uh, how this could work, you know, here's, this is a study that was done about 10 years ago. You may have heard about this paper that came out that said that all fisheries were going to be gone by 2048. Well, that was, that was this study that was led by Boris Worm um, that was basically, here's the fraction of fisheries that were collapsed as a function of time. You're seeing it going 
you know, higher and higher fraction going down here. And if you extend this line down to where it hits 100%, it was 2048. Um, what this ignored, though, is that there are a whole variety of places where people have tried, and largely as a result of Garrett Hardin, different kinds of approaches. And so here's a class of fisheries where, that were started in the 1970s that were managed like that example I just gave you where everybody has exclusive rights to a fraction of the catch and you get a completely different trajectory going in opposite direction of time. So this is one class of solution and my main point here is not to go into the details of how this works but to point out that we know how to fix fisheries for them to get substantially higher yields and this is just one class of approaches. They're really proven successes. So we can come back to this pattern of where we are today and we can compare two scenarios. If we don't do anything about fixing fisheries, this is what we forecast that trajectory is going to look like over the next 30 years. Okay? It's going to continue on its downward path until it levels out at about 15% of fisheries being in a good place. If we were to apply these different kinds of approaches which we know are successful for every single fishery starting today, this is what our projection for global production looks like. Okay? All right, so now this allows us to say, okay, how much more fish could we actually catch if we got our act together and fixed all the world's fisheries? That's a big challenge, but here's what the answer is. About 8 million metric tons of fish fillets. We could catch that much more. And that's, oh, that's compared to today. If we compare it to where we're going to be in the future, it's substantially more. So the problem is going to get worse from the standpoint of the ocean contribution. And by the way, this is associated with 300 million metric tons more fish in the sea and about $40 billion more in profits in fisheries. So there's a lot of reasons to do this. And this is part of the reason why I spend probably half of my life these days working on issues related to fixing fisheries. But the reason I'm going to stop talking about fixing fisheries is because we've got to go back to this problem. So here's, here's our challenge. We've got this much growth in demand, and we just now gave an estimate of if we fixed every wild fishery on the planet, how much of that red bar could we actually produce with new production? Here's the answer. Watch carefully. It's just that. It's about that all that additional fish is only about 8% of the projected growth in demand. Okay? So I'm not trying to trivialize the importance of doing this because if we don't fix these fisheries, then the contribution of the ocean is going to go down, not go up. Right? And so and this is, in every way, it's beneficial from an environmental standpoint. We are fixing a problem that we are having lots of environmental consequences. So we're getting more fish, more money, way more fish in the sea, lots of environmental benefits. It's the absolute thing we should be doing. But it doesn't come close to solving this problem. Hence the second half of the talk, which is aquaculture. So, I actually went into that comment th without ever doing the math on this, thinking, oh, fixing all the world's fisheries is going to be a huge fraction of solving this problem. And then, you know, two weeks later, after we kind of did some rough back of the envelope calculation, we realized that, no, it, you know, it's, it's a really important thing to do for all kinds of reasons, including livelihoods and environmental benefits and food security and things like that. But it's not going to be anywhere close to a huge contributor to this question. So that started getting us thinking about aquaculture and how might it play a role in this same um, situation. Now aquaculture, you've probably, people have heard a lot about um, aquaculture. I find mostly from the standpoint of the failures of aquaculture, problems with, for example, cutting mangroves and turning them into shrimp ponds or uh, diseases that are associated with growing uh, fish in too dense of clusters or uh, nutrients that are put into the coastal ocean as a result of too much feed or the feces from growing fish. But 
you know, what we have to do, and I think this is the point I tried to make before when we compared fisheries, we've got to compare all of these different forms of food production with the same analysis. So let's look at aquaculture today, despite the fact that um, in many ways it's still relatively immature as a form of food production compared to land-based and wild-based fisheries. We already know that this side over here, which is great environmentally, can't solve the problem, but it helps a little bit. So if you look at aquaculture though, again, in the major differences here tend to be how you grow the fish and to some extent whether it's growing fish that you have to feed or growing things like shellfish that are going to feed on uh, plankton or other kinds of food out of the water. But the basic answer that comes out of this is very similar over here, that if we look at best case practices, if we look at even averages for the types of ways of growing food, they're half or better than what the average is for any form of land production. And if we look at best case practices, which here again you can't even see, it's going to be, as you'll see in a second, in many cases, a hundred times less than the impact of any of these forms of food production. When we pulled together this information for all forms of existing aquaculture, I was actually really surprised. Um, because I never really, to tell you the truth, I hadn't even thought that much about aquaculture that much until we started doing this. And so we've dug into this in um, a very big way. And so I want to I want to think, you know, there's, there's just some examples of different pathways, of different kinds of food production. You can imagine different preferences that people might have in the future. Um, and I want to look at not just greenhouse gases, but several different environmental impacts and look at what the costs of producing this entire amount of food would be. And I just want to do a thought experiment with us, just to imagine that um, we try to produce all of this amount of food with each option. So for example, if we want to think about what the impacts of beef would be, we say, well, suppose we, that we produced all of this amount of additional animal protein with cows. What would that do? Well, how, how big of the impact would it be? Or if we did it with goats or chickens or um, mussels and oysters or farm salmon. Okay, we can kind of ask a thought experiment and what this looks like. So I showed you greenhouse gases already, and what, I've, uh, what I'm doing on this is arraying them where the brown things are production on land. I've got the ones I showed you before, uh, cows, goats and sheep, pork, chickens, and then you've got um, some other forms of protein that you can have animal protein with milk and eggs. Then I, I've just averaged, forgetting about all the potential within fisheries to actually do much better with the best choices. I'm just taking the average for fed fin fish and the average for unfed aquaculture, so shellfish, like mussels and clams and things like that. And then to compare them, I put three kind of staples of if we actually didn't see this shift to uh, animal protein, what, what the impacts would be from comparable amounts of production of plant material. Okay? So you can kind of see, same thing we said before, big decline. Um, the, aquaculture is as good or better even with the average today without all the potential for technological improvements as any option on land. The main reason why aquaculture works so much better than production on land is because everything we eat on land is warm-blooded. So we're eating mammals and birds and a huge amount of the food they consume goes into producing heat, not stuff to eat. Whereas Fish, almost, well, everything we eat, well, not everything. There are some things, some people eat some things out of the ocean that are not fish, but these are cold-blooded, and so they're just way more efficient in terms of converting a certain amount of food into food that we would consume. And that plays a gigantic role in everything I'm going to show you. So here's greenhouse gases. I'm not going to go into the details of any of these. I'm going to show you a better way to look at this in a second, but I'm just showing that the pattern turns out to be the same for a whole variety of environmental impacts. So one of them is how much nutrients get put into the environment, whether it's into watersheds, into streams and lakes, or eventually flows into the ocean. Same kind of a pattern. Um, aquaculture does better, and in fact, unfed aquaculture is better than even producing um, vegetable material. Another is freshwater use. 
Okay? Uh, this is obviously right at the forefront of everybody's thinking right now. The amount of freshwater use is dramatically less for aquaculture than anything on land, including a vegetarian diet. And lastly, how much area we would have to actually devote new area to food production. Same kind of a thing where, again, in many cases, 10 to 100, in some cases even more than that, difference between the worst option and the best option. Okay, so these are graphs, but you know, these things don't, and, they, and you, you may be thinking, wow, that's a big difference and stuff. But I want to put them in the context of something that makes it more tangible of what these kinds of values would actually be. So let's do that. Let's do this thought experiment with area. And we're going to look at, in each of these cases, I'm going to show you the worst option on the left and the best option on the right in terms of how much new area would we have to put into food production, converting from what the natural landscape is today, whether it's in the ocean or on land, to produce that much food by these different options. So the worst case scenario, although cows are about the same, in this case is goats and sheep, if you wanted to produce that total projected growth in demand with this option, you'd have to put into an area that's equivalent to 85% of the land area of South America into new food production. First, we know that's not going to happen. Um, but that changes, the, I think, the impact that you can appreciate here from a graph that shows a bar that's really high that you can't say, well, OK, fine, it's 10 times as big, but who cares? It is a big deal if we're talking about having to produce that much additional land area into food production to be able to produce that much additional meat. At the other extreme, the most efficient in terms of area is growing mussels. And if we do them, grow them at the level that New Zealand, for example, grows mussels today, which is kind of the world standard in terms of levels of production, you could produce all of that projected growth in demand in an area that's less than the shallow region around New Zealand. So this is the contrast in terms of environmental impacts of that much additional food production with, if we're talking about animals that are produced on land, versus best options in, in the sea. Now all the other ones are in between these two, but these differences are just whoppingly different. And I don't think anybody could argue that the impact of this amount of land conversion would be, have a, a global impact that is going to be enormous compared to this kind of conversion in the sea. Thought experiment number two, greenhouse gases. Here's our worst culprit, mainly because of things that come out of its mouth. So I, t I started by, showing, by telling you that food production is a big part of this problem that we need to be thinking more about. If we were to produce that much additional beef, it would be equivalent to adding the greenhouse gas emissions that 81% of China's total greenhouse gas emissions today to the problem. That's the world's biggest producer. Or 130% of all of the US's greenhouse gas emissions. That is a whopping effect. And everything that we're talking about in Paris is not talking about reductions that are going to be close to what this kind of addition is going to be coming on the food system side. So we've got to hope that this is not the scenario that happens. Again, in this case, the best case scenario is mussels. Uh, it's equivalent to a, a little bit less than the greenhouse gas emissions of England. In Ireland. Again, orders of magnitude difference in impacts. Thought experiment number three, fresh water. How much more fresh water would we have to have available for food production to do this on land at the extreme end of this? So for cows, here's what it turns out to be. You need a volume of water equivalent to the total volume of Lake Huron every year in terms of new water for agricultural production on the planet. Where is that going to come from? The other extreme mussels you can see are just 
killing it on the good side of here. Um, mussels, you could do, they don't require any water. It's, there's no fresh water impact of production from shellfish like this. So I guess my, my message on this is that the analysis of this when we look at impacts across the board, I think there's been a lot of discussion about negative impacts of human interactions with the sea in terms of food production, both for wild fisheries and for aquaculture. And those are true. There are problems. We've got a lot of problems we still need to fix. But if we do a level analysis and look at those impacts compared to the comparable impacts in terms of food production on land, even with today's average practices, it's dramatically lower impact by food production in the sea. There's one other added benefit is that, as you probably are well aware, there's also been a whole variety of studies in terms of looking at how diet affects human health. And there was a, a really amazing study that came out about a year and a half ago that looked at essentially all different kinds of diets. Um, and then they looked at it from the standpoint of how the level of average uh, impact of different diseases from dif associated with different diets was. And uh, I, you know, there's a lot to talk about. The three diets that come out the top from the standpoint of most are a Mediterranean diet, a pescatarian diet, which is basically a vegetarian diet with some fish. And this is basically a vegetarian diet with certain types of vegetarian components, nuts and oils and things, with some fish. And the, the key one to look at is this over here, where we look at average effect. Everything here is kind of looking at the, across the average human diet. So a zero means that it's comparable to what the average diet is. And so there are, some other, there are lots of diseases. And so th here's a perfect example. Vegetarian diet has some really positive effects for certain kinds of diseases. But if we look at the net effect on lifespan, it's basically exactly the same as the average lifespan for humans. The two diets that are off the charts in terms of affecting the average overall effect in terms of human lifespan are Mediterranean and pescatarian, which increase on average lifespan 15 to 20%. What's the difference between these? It's fish. It's seafood is the primary difference between these diets. So I think the key message that comes out of this is that if we're looking into the future, um, food production from the sea has huge benefits, both for human health and for the health of the planet, relative to expansion, great expansion of food production on land. There are a lot of issues we still have to solve in terms of the food production in the sea, and that's something that I think that needs a lot of creativity and a lot of effort to kind of pick up the pace but even if we look at the average impacts today, they're lower than all of these forms of food production on land. So my view of this is we've got this big challenge coming. And I think that anything that leads to the ocean playing a bigger role in food production over the next 35 years is going to be good for both people and for the planet. And so we need to get on it in terms of really figuring out how we interact with the sea in a way that maximizes the level of production that we can get with minimal kinds of impacts. But if we do that and combine that with any kind of policy that actually shifts more consumption from the sea, the net effects for both people and the planet are going to be hugely positive. So I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So okay. Who we, uh, and I'll help you. Who's got a hand raised? Oh, somebody's helping you with lights already. Some questions for Dr. Gaines. Yeah. My concern is all the chemicals that have been dumped in the ocean and the level of mercury in that. How, how do we solve that to be able to do this? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a very good question. That, that again, 
you ha there, so there have been a variety of studies such as with mercury, for example, looking at mercury concentrations in, that move up in food chains. And so, um, but again, this is something you have to look at as a level playing field analysis. Those kinds of um, chemical impacts that we have on the environment translate into most of the things we eat on land too. I mean, there may be different things and they get taken up in different ways, uh, but uh, that, that's a, a problem that I think is characteristic of both systems. Um, to some extent, um, yeah, it's, it's an issue that I think has only recently really come into clarity in terms of the scope of species and the types of problems and the nature of the, uh, this is basically a land-ocean interaction. It's like, what are we doing that goes into watersheds that gets dumped into the sea? Or what are we doing that goes into the atmosphere? That's where mercury comes into play. It's from power production mostly. Goes up into the atmosphere and then precipitates into the ocean. So th these are problems that are, I think, generic across all forms of food production. And there are big issues to resolve. Um, they're not ones, though, even though you hear about mercury from the standpoint of, of seafood, you know, there are other forms of chemical uh, issues that are associated with antibiotics, pesticides, and a whole variety of things like that on the land side of this as well. So these are really important issues to fix. But again, I think we have to think about that is a, another way that we're interacting with our food supply that we need to um, do, whoa, do in a much more sustainable way. That was not a good idea. <laughs> if we start. Uh, let me take care of that. Yeah, I'll okay. You, you can just hang that up like that. Okay. Let me put the top on this. <laughs> Next question. Another question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm curious because looking back the past 20 years, we looked at seafood costs go up um, somewhere between 800 uh, 800% to 1,000% cost. Yeah. What's it going to do to the populations that don't have the financial stability yeah. to pay for food, even though it's a great system right. for right. us to use the ocean as a food source? So that is, that is a great question. And there, there are several components, I think, that are important to the answer to that. One is our perception of the cost of fish is actually not the perception of the cost of animal protein if you look across the developing world. That in fact, throughout most of the developing world, the cheapest form of animal protein is fish. Um, so we tend to consume and purchase high-end um, fish that a lot of it's imported um, that is very expensive per, per pound, often much more so than land-based protein. But if you look at the average price of, of protein throughout the developing world, fish on average is actually the cheapest. Um, so that, that helps. Where, it's a pro where the biggest problem, though, comes into play is that first thing that I showed about where more people are going to be, which is Africa, and where more wealth is going to drive more consumption demand, which is Asia. So that creates a really big problem because more than half of that growth is associated with people that are getting wealthier and they're eating more meat because they can afford to eat it and it's part of an interesting diet. I, I suspect that what that's going to be doing is it's, we're not going to actually see that level of consumption happen. What we're going to see is prices go up, which is going to create food security problems in Africa. That this increase in global meat demand in other places is going to drive more food security problems in Africa where you've got people, more people, but not explosive growth in wealth. And so, I, I, you know, that's, that's a distribution problem that I think is something we got to really think seriously about in terms of how this, uh, the nature of that growth is going to create food security problems that have a geography to them um, that, that is going to require different kinds of solutions. So, how do we know what types of fish we should be eating? Because um, I know that it's like we should be really thinking about, you know, what types of fish, where they're from, how they're caught. You know, so how do we know what types of fish we should be eating? So, this is a good question, you know, and there are a variety of organizations that have done a really good job of, of trying to do these kinds of analyses. One of the big problems is that when you think about what we eat on land, you're talking about fewer than a dozen species total on the entire planet of the bulk of animal consumption. So it's, kind of, it's a lot easier to kind of make some comparisons about what things do. In the sea, it's 15,000 different species are being consumed in fisheries. So 
One answer to that question is you are never going to know detailed answers across all of those different kinds of fisheries. But there's a lot, you know, the kinds of things that are commonly available. So the Seafood Watch program, for example, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and I know there's, there's a lot of uh, activities here looking at uh, sustainability programs along those lines as well. Those are, those are very good for, you know, the common kinds of things you're really going to see in, in local restaurants, and they've produced them uh, for local kinds of markets in different parts of the world. But the problem that I've seen, and I've had conversations with them in a long ways, in a lot of places, is I commonly will see people go into a restaurant, they pull out their card, and they're looking at the fish, and there's like three things on the, on the menu that are not on that seafood card. And they go, well, now what do I do? And so then they go, I'm going to have a steak. And so <laughs> this, is where, this is where the consequences of, and, and so I've been talking with the Monterey Bay Aquarium is, They've got to emphasize that you want to drive sustainability within this space, but you don't want to necessarily drive shifts in diet that are far worse in terms of environmental impacts than actually consuming a fish that's not being that sustainably harvested. So that's a, that's a difficult challenge, I think, in terms of coming across. And the best way to do that is to fix most of the fisheries to the point where we don't have to worry about it too much. I mean, so this, I mean, this is going to take some time. But as I said, there are some real successes. About half of the total catch of fish on the planet today is being caught at a level that is quite sustainable. And we should be you know, applauding that. But it's a small number of very large fisheries that are mostly in that category. The bulk of the problem is the small scale, lots of artisanal fisheries that make up the bulk of the biodiversity and, and a lot of the fisheries in the developing world. And that's where our biggest challenges are in terms of, I think, dealing with some of these, these kinds of issues. But, you know, you've got to use the best available information, but you've also got to be careful that you don't use the lack of information about some seafood choices to make uh, a choice that might be worse by switching into a totally different category of food, if that's something you're really concerned about. Yeah. Oh, have you heard, or you probably not, but there's a type of um, fishing where you have a farm and there's fish, and then you have plants growing on top and they feed each other. Yes. Would you think that would be a good way to increase food? Yeah, so this is, this is, this is one of the examples of um, technological developments that, are, that have, I mean, there, there are actually some old practices of doing this in China, uh, but it's becoming more of, a, of an approach in some of the uh, technological approaches where the idea is you combine production of fish at the surface. And so when you feed the fish, some of the feed doesn't get consumed. And instead of falling to the bottom, and when their feces come out, instead of falling to the bottom, you grow beneath that, you grow mussels or clams and seaweed that are utilizing the nutrients and utilizing this food. It's called multi-trophic level aquaculture. It can increase the efficiency dramatically over what the values I showed you. So this is, again, I think, pointing out that the l average level we're talking about with aquaculture today, as good as it is, can get a lot better with these kinds of innovations in terms of thinking creatively about how we uh, combine uh, things and grow them with different kinds of approaches that can actually lower these values even more. So there's a lot of scope for, ben for new improvements. Yeah. yeah. What I think you're, what I'm hearing you say then <clears throat> is with the increase in protein consumption, we're going to need to learn to eat mussels. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love mussels, but you know, yeah. So no, I, I, I don't want to imply that you, you, we should all be thinking about this. Is that there's going to be two or three things that have the lowest impact, and that's what everybody should be focusing on. It's more a matter of, I mean that. To be honest, behavior change is hard in terms of getting people to shift diets. I mean, the other way you could solve this problem is get everybody on the planet to become a vegetarian. It dramatically lowers the impact in, in a lot of different ways. But that's, that's not going to happen at a planetary scale. And so it's more a matter of thinking about anything that tends to shift things more towards that right end of the scale is beneficial. And you don't have to go all the way to only eating mussels. I mean, the difference between those, again, was factors of, in some cases, 500 in terms of the amount. And there were lots of choices in between that were still 
50 to 100 times better than eating cows. I mean, so there's, there's a lot of diversity in this in terms of opportunities for minimizing impacts and still leaving a lot of choices. And it doesn't mean you also have to never eat beef. I, it's more a matter of you cut beef consumption in half in your diet, it has a huge impact. Sure, if you get it all the way to zero, it has even bigger impact, but the, the real point of this is there are a variety of aspects of diet shift that can have dramatic impacts that don't involve you having to go to a really extreme diet. And I think, I think you know, that's more the idea of what I hope is the message out of this is that if there are policies that get put in place that tend to shift things more from the left to the right, that's going to be good for the planet. It doesn't have to go all the way to the right for us to have really dramatic benefits. Yes? Please send the government to pass that genetically modified threats. What is the take of this genetically modified threats? Which grows huge. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, if you look at what we've done in terms of agricultural production on land, um, whether it's historical breeding programs or modern techniques that, in, that we call GMO, they're all genetically modified, right? And if you look at everything we grow in agriculture, it's been bred to have characteristics that enhance its properties for agriculture. There are very few wild uh, you know, wild genotype plants that we grow in agriculture. They've all been genetically modified, not by modern techniques, but by breeding. In the same way that every one, uh, the cows and chickens and sheep, they're not, those are not wild genotypes that are like the, you know, the wild uh, stock that was the original base. They have, their, their genetics are dramatically different and they've been bred for the same kinds of things, more rapid, production of, of meat or more, uh, fo you know, more production of milk, even though they're not producing baby. I mean, there's all kinds of characteristics of things that we've bred things for that enhance their food production. And so I, 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 my own personal view on genetically modified is you really want to think about what is the modification doing, not the technique. Because I actually think modern genetic techniques can be more effective at actually uh, causing a change that you are interested in. But you know, you can also uh, put in genes that are doing something that you may not like. I mean, uh, whether it's a pesticide or, or, or other kinds of resistance that are bred in where they may have negative effects. But it's not the genetic, it's not the technique of genetic modification that's the problem. It's what you modify the genes to do. So in the case of the, sh of the fish, the reason why, I mean, it's, it's much more analogous to what we have done for centuries in terms of land-based food production, which is you breed the stock that we're producing for meat in a way that they allocate more of their energy to meat production than they do to producing eggs. Because if you're growing aquaculture, every calorie that you feed that fish that it puts into egg production is effectively wasted food that has a bigger environmental impact because it's never going to reproduce. You're going to eat the meat before it reproduces. And that's the same thing that has, been, has happened for all kinds of land-based production of, of meats is a shift in production from allocation to reproduction to allocation to growth of material that we like to eat. So, from the, if, so I mean, I, th that's, that's the challenge. I think the big problem and the big unknown in things like this is if you're growing, if you're doing this genetic modification of a fish and you're putting it into the environment, some of those genes can escape because some of the fish can escape. And then you're introducing those same genes into wild stocks. And that's, I think, really the question that we should be asking is, is that going to have negative effects? Because if your real goal here is to reduce the environmental impacts of production, then if you, whether you, you take the salmon and you take 100 years of multiple breeding across lots of generations to get them to allocate more to uh, tissue production as opposed to egg production, which is what happened on land, or we do this more rapidly using modern techniques, um, that side actually has net benefits in terms of food production. And so if we were to go back, if we were to take all of our land-based food production and go back to the native levels of productivity of all those species, we would have massive food problems on the planet today. So breeding 
has genetically modified things. And so I think it's more you have to think about this as what are the genes you're putting in? And there are really important issues that come into play in terms of, I think, certain kinds of genetic modifications that everybody should be skeptical about. But there are other ones I think you have to think. What's, what are the net costs and benefits of doing this? And is this something that has a net benefit for both you as a consumer and for the planet? And I think that's kind of the way I like to think about these problems. Maybe one more question, Steve, if we could, please? Sure. Yes. yes. So are the uh, folks in uh, Paris discussing these issues? It would seem like this is sort of the elephant in the room. I think it is, and I think, no, they're not discussing food systems at all. So uh, the other example of this is not on the table. If you look, California has a cap and trade system, mo one of the models for the planet in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Food is excluded from that cap and trade. So it's not even part of California's system in terms of thinking about how we reduce emissions. We've focused purely on transportation and energy production for buildings and manufacturing. So I do think this is the gorilla in the room, you know, in the sense that um, it's a big component today. And if this doubles, so that, you know, if we just have exactly the same preferences, but we double the total amount of consumption, we're doubling these, these average impacts. And if you, so if you take th that 30% and double that, even if we take the other two thirds and have it go to zero. If we completely you know, solve all the other energy problem, we're still at two thirds of greenhouse gas emissions that we are today. So we have to, I think, think about food as a key part of the problem. And it's, in many ways, it's the one that's easiest to solve because it's associated with choices. It's associated with best practices that exist already. I mean, you saw in every single one of those, the difference between average and best practices was often a factor of 10. That's huge. Uh, and that kind of impact, if we actually are, and so this is again, think about a policy option like, suppose there's a carbon tax or the cap and trade in California actually affected food. You would have 100 times the carbon tax on beef that you would on mussels. That will affect behavior, I guarantee you. Um, so I, I, you know, I, it does need to be brought into the discussion, but it's not. And I think there are big enough challenges getting the other uh, components of this problem um, going in the right direction that this is naturally going to be secondary. And you also have to couple in the fact that if we ma manipulate things that affect food prices, we start creating these kinds of food security issues that we have to also grapple with as well. So it's a complicated problem, but I think um, if we really think about it as a level analysis, there's a lot we can do to reduce the impacts of food production on these kinds of large environmental problems. Dr. Gaines, thank you so much. Thank you. A small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank I'll let you. you enjoy that. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very much. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, Dr. Gaines will be here uh, for a little while to answer some of your questions. Uh, I think we'll slowly move him. Uh, Dr. Passarelli will take him into the back so we can, we can get some questions answered beyond what we were able to do tonight.